Hello, StatOil executives. It's a pleasure to be here with you today to talk about onshore wind. Uh, what you asked us to look about look at is the entry strategy. In our journey from a fossil fuel company to a renewable energy company, you asked us to develop a plan for onshore wind turbines. Well, the first thing to look at is the social responsibility aspect of this. And I know Statoil is in the process of changing your name to Equinor, and you're moving from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. So this is definitely something of importance to look at. And the economic element, first of all, in CSR. Uh, it is definitely economic, and that's the, now is the time to get into this uh, business. It's legal. Following all Norwegian and local laws and regulations is, in, is going to be important. And it's ethical because, as you said, you want to create energy for people and progress for society. One thing we have to think about in the future is that whatever we decide to do, uh, looking into moving up to the philanthropic element of CSR um, to help people in the areas in which we deploy our wind farms. Looking at market attractiveness, we have five elements to look at. And basically what we find is that the onshore wind market is an attractive one for stat oil. Uh, the power of suppliers and the threat of substitutes is not that high. And it looks like it's an attractive market that we should pursue. So we did an extensive analysis of winds in the earth. And what we found was that there is four main sites that look interesting for future consideration. Uh, the southern coast of South Africa, the southeastern coast of Australia, the southern coast of, Ur coast of Uruguay in South America, and the western coast of Ireland. So now we need to ask, can we do business with these four target countries? And we can look at their culture, the administrative connections that uh, Norway has with these countries, the geographic distance, sea links, time zone differences, and the similarity in climates is something that we can look at. And then the economics. Norway, of course, is a rich, modern country. And the other countries, the greater the gap between Norway and these other countries, it might make it a little more difficult to do business there. So we want to look at that. And we find that Ireland is going to be a good fit for stat oil. Uh, South Africa or, and Australia are going to be neutral, and Uruguay is less of a good fit. Now looking at culture, is stat oil's Norwegian culture a good fit for these four target countries? And here we're looking at the dimensions of power, distance, individualism, collectivism, masculinity, uncertainty, avoidance, and long-term orientation. And a main finding is that there's a very large difference between the Norwegian culture of femininity and the South African culture of masculinity. That's the largest difference we identified in looking at these four countries using these dimensions. And so that's something we're going to be taking into account. So now looking at a decision matrix for the four target countries, we take five criteria to look at. So first of all, the economic logic. Does it work economically to build a wind farm in each of these countries? And can the citizens use the electricity generated? Can they pay an appropriate price that will provide us a profit margin? And we find that South Africa, definitely yes. Australia, yes. Ireland, yes. These are developed countries and uh, they have a large population that uses electricity. Uh, Uruguay, it's maybe a little more uncertain, but it's, it's neutral. So economic logic is good for, for uh, three of the four countries. The location of sustained winds it was a main criteria for choosing the four countries, so they're all positive here. 
And then looking at the analysis of the country, political, social, technological, environmental, and legal factors, that was a, a pestle analysis that was done. Uh, South Africa was a negative on this variable, um, mainly because of the legal, political side. We're less certain about the long-term stability of the South African economy. And so therefore that one was rated as a, as a negative. Uruguay, a, a neutral, and Australia and Ireland were quite confident about, and so those are rated as positives. The cultural distance between Norway and each of the four target countries we discussed a little bit earlier. And Uruguay is the negative here, mainly because of the distance and also the cultural difference of the different language, uh, Spanish versus Norwegian. Um, maybe speak a little bit less English in Uruguay. And so that should be a little bit harder to do business in Uruguay. And then the culture fit between Norway and the target country uh, we also discussed earlier, and South Africa earns a negative on this score uh, or on this criterion. Uh, because they're much more masculine orientation uh, as compared to Norway's uh, feminist. So looking at the set of decisions, we find that Ireland is the best choice for onshore wind, and we're going to definitely explore that further. So in terms of implementation, we thought that Ireland should be the first choice and we should immediately start work on developing a wind farm of 30 turbines in Ireland. We definitely need a reasonably large wind farm in order to get economies of scale. And when we send in uh, technicians to maintain the turbines, we need a number of turbines to pay for the expenses of getting to them there by helicopter uh, so that they can service a number of the turbines. and spread the cost over, the, over that number. In terms of Ireland, we thought that partnering with a local company uh, was, a, was a decent choice. Acquiring an existing wind farm is something that could work as well. Or if possible, we could acquire land for a greenfield site. Those are the three entry strategies. And we have to explore further which of those is the best choice for Ireland. Next year, 2019, uh, we're looking at moving into Australia, again with a 30 turbine wind farm. And here we're thinking of a greenfield site. The eastern coast of Australia is 1,000 kilometers long, and so there's a number of farms and land that could be available there. And we think a brand new operation uh, given that Australia is going to be easy to work with, they all speak English, and of course many Norwegians speak English. So this is our preferred market strategy. Once we've learned our, some lessons from Ireland, we'll be ready to move to Australia. The next year after, we think it's time to investigate Uruguay. And here where our plan is to find a local company to partner with that already either has a wind farm in operation or has close connections with the government and the energy industry to help us uh, in a partnership arrangement with those uh, permissions to get our farm going there. And then in 2021, we think we'll be knowledgeable enough to move to South Africa. And here we're going to seek to acquire a local company uh, that can run operations for Statoil in their local market. So here, the idea would be to have a local operation wholly owned by Statoil and retain the management and staff talent to run the operation there for us. And that will deal with the problems of there being quite different culturally in terms of a masculine culture. Uh, so we think that that will solve that problem. So here's a chart of the timeline and expenses in each of the four countries by year. And as you can see, this the investment is significant. The total investment is 220 million. Uh, we're using US dollars here. 
we know Norway uses the krone. And we are also added a line for our research and development for onshore wind. And that's a steady state uh, million US dollars a year or per quarter for each of those four years. So key performance indicators. In the areas that we have identified, the five areas, we've identified a number of KPI measures and when they should be um, measured and indicated so that we know how we're doing. Financial, the budget spend, the customers, can they, are they buying the electricity? Can they pay for it? Um, how are we doing in terms of growth of sales? Process, we're going to measure percentage of turbine downtime and the installations that we're putting in. Are we meeting those targets? Uh, logistics, we have to make sure that we have a steady state of turbines coming in from our suppliers, which we'll buy off the shelf and the maintenance of those using the parts. We have to have a, a steady state part supply from our suppliers. And then our research and development operation, we're going to measure their patents in terms of wind farm technology. So there are risks to consider, and here's a slide showing the four kinds of risks, the four categories of risks. And the next slide shows our determination of where these risks are and what mitigations there might be. So the, the um, teal risk, the strategic risk, is that customer demand switches from wind to solar. And we think that's a moderate likelihood and will have low impact on us because our research and development operation can also start researching solar energy. The green risk is the hazard risk of hurricanes or cyclones in Australia that they damage turbines. And our mitigation is to make sure that we have operational insurance, but also computer controlled systems to shut turbines down in high wind situations. The orange risk is the financial risk that foreign currency exchange rates will change dramatically, affecting the money uh, the profits that we can repatriate and the value of those profits. So we think by doing foreign currency uh, futures contracts, we can mitigate that risk. And the operational risk is shown here in red and blue, but it's the, it's the uh, red dot and the blue square. And that is that it might be difficult to source turbines and parts from the supply chain. Uh, there are only a few suppliers of wind turbines that we buy off the shelf. We think that we should actually use different suppliers and for different wind farms and make sure that we have relationships with all these different suppliers so that we spread our risk out across the, uh, the different suppliers so that no one, so if one supplier runs into trouble, then we're not wholly dependent on that supplier. So we're now ready for any questions about our plan and we look forward to discussing them with you.